voice is going live. Yeah. Yep, that's what it says. You're in the show. Everyone can see and hear you. Right. So, Rekha, my address, three to five minutes? Yeah, we have 15 minutes between the three of us. Okay. I'm happy to give you my 45 minutes. <laughs> no, 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 thank you. I was trying to make it less, not more. <laughs> Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. A very warm welcome to you all. Thank you for joining us at the first ever online national management convention of All India Management Association. The theme of the convention this year is getting through the pandemic and beyond. And we are privileged to have a most distinguished lineup of speakers, dignitaries, and a very eminent audience, not only from across India, but also from different parts of the world who have joined us for the convention. We have received over 7,000 registrations this year for the convention, which is being organized on this specially curated digital platform. Live streaming on IMA's YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter channels is also expected to increase the viewership. We would like to thank all our sponsors who have supported the convention and made it possible for us to organize it this year. We thank you, our sponsors, Kirloska Brothers Limited, Co-sponsors, Usha International and Vodafone Limited, and associate sponsors, Kevin Care Private Limited, Godrich Consumer Products, JK Paper Limited, Neo Foods, RP Sanjeev Goenka Group, and Tata Chemicals Limited. Our corporate sponsors are Firebird Institute of Research and Management, Indian Oil Corporation Limited, Nico Engineering Services Limited. Peton International, Triveni Tribune Limited, and our committee of hosts, Dempo Group of Companies, and Tita Girl Wagons Limited. A big thanks to you all, all our sponsors, for their support at the convention. Ladies and gentlemen, all through the convention, we will be conducting live polls during the sessions. Click on the poll button visible towards the right side of the video screen to be the poll, poll questions and participate by sharing your opinion online. All questions during the convention sessions will be taken through chat only. Please do submit your questions in the chat box and specify the speaker it is addressed to. We invite you to join us for as many sessions as possible. And we do hope that you enjoy being part of this convention. In case of a disconnect, you can rejoin the session by yourself without any difficulty using the same login and credentials. Ladies and gentlemen, we are starting with the opening session of IMA's 47th National Management Convention. May I invite on the virtual stage, Mr. Sanjay Kirloskar, President IMA and Chairman and Managing Director Kirloskar Brothers Limited, Mr. Sanjeev, Mr. Sunil Kant Munjal, Chairman NMC 2020, and Chairman Hero Enterprises, Mr. Paul Sefo, Technology Forecaster and Adjunct Professor, Stanford University, Mr. Rajiv Makhani, Managing Editor, Technology, NDTV, and Ms. Rekha Sethi, Director General, All India Management Association. Ladies and gentlemen, a huge round of applause as I welcome Ms. Rekha Sethi and welcome all the dignitaries on the die with this. I'll hand over the question to Ms. Rekha. I now hand over the okay. session to Ms. Rekha Sethi. Good morning. Good morning, Professor Paul Safo, Mr. Rajiv Makni, Mr. Sanjay Kiloskar, Mr. Sunil Munjal, ladies and gentlemen. 
It's my pleasure to welcome you at IMA's 47th National Management Convention, the first ever online convention in the history of IMA. Then COVID has taught us much more and much faster than perhaps we wanted to learn. And IMA's digital transformation has now become an ongoing process. Paul, such a pleasure to have you with us on the IMA platform once again, though I had thought we would have that pleasure in UC Berkeley this summer, but wonderful to have you with us, with us digitally as well. It must be pretty late in the US, and I truly appreciate that you've agreed to do the opening session of IMA's convention. Rajiv, it is indeed a pleasure to have you with us at IMA, I think for the first time. It would have been far nicer to have met you in person, but hopefully soon when we have the pandemic behind us. Right. A warm welcome to two people who have made this convention possible and have been there with advice, suggestions, and support throughout our first tryst with a virtual convention. Mr. Sanjay Kirloska, President IMA, who rightly says we have made him work over time, and Mr. Sunil Khan Punjal, Chairman of the convention, who despite his very busy schedule find, found time to guide us through putting together this event for you all. My very grateful thanks to you, Mr. Kirloska and Mr. Munjal. I also want to warmly welcome all IMA office bearers, past presidents, members of IMA Council, corporate and individual members, local management associations, media, and all friends of IMA who have joined us today. I'm also delighted that we are joined by a large number of people from across the world, and the overall attendance in this NMC is in many thousands instead of hundreds. The digital platform has given us the flexibility to also have many global thought leaders who would be joining the convention's discussions, which would give us a great variety of perspective. With over 50 outstanding speakers and around 18 sessions, this convention promises to be the biggest we have done so far with something for everyone, be it a search for a COVID vaccine or a deep dive into the state of the Indian economy to even a lighter moment with a stand-up comedian. I do hope you enjoy the convention as much as we've enjoyed putting it together. With these words, I'm delighted to hand over to Mr. Sanjay Kirloska, President Aima. Over to you, Mr. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Rekha. Sunil uh, Kamjal, Convention Chairman and Chairman Hero Enterprise, Paul Safo, Technology Forecaster and Adjunct Professor, Stanford University, Rajiv Makhni, Rekha Sethi, Ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed a pleasure to have you all with us in IMA's 47th National Management Convention. This is an unprecedented NMC, as Rekha has said, as we meet digitally from wherever we are instead of gathering under one roof. But these are unprecedented times. COVID has interrupted our way of life, and we find ways to do our things remotely and safely. Many things have changed during COVID which are unlikely to go back to the old normal. Therefore, the overarching theme of this NMC is getting through the pandemic and beyond. Our economy is trying to recover as lockdowns give way to unlocking. India's GDP was smaller by a quarter in the April-June period, but it is regaining growth momentum. However, despite lockdowns and contract tracing apps, the COVID situation remains a big concern. In fact, we've become the second most infected country in the world. And if this trend continues, we will be number one in the world in terms of COVID cases. Nevertheless, India is in touch with leading vaccine developers in the world. And we are confident with our vaccine manufacturing leadership, our country will be amongst the first to get rid of the COVID menace. In the past six months, IMA has reinvented itself and reached out to its members, students, and other stakeholders digitally. And entire, the entire revenue of IMA has actually moved online. Hopefully, humanity will find a way to check the virus menace soon. And we will be able to see each other in person safely again. It's only appropriate that we are starting the NMC with a session on accelerating the future. Before COVID, the world was thinking about the future only in terms of new technologies. After COVID, we have to think differently. We're therefore privileged to have one of the world's celebrated futurists, Mr. Paul Saffold. He will take us on a trip to 
futures frontiers where no one has gone before. It is now my pleasure to invite the convention chairman, Mr. Sunil Kantanjal, to share his opening remarks on the convention. Thank you. Thank you, Sanjay. Uh, Paul, Rajiv, Sanjay, Rekha, office bearers of IMA, ladies and gentlemen. It is truly a pleasure and a delight to be able to guide IMA as this very unique event was being set up. Our first set of conversations was, would people spend time to listen to others for an extended period of time for a conference that goes on for two days? And my response to Rekha was, it actually doesn't matter. People will come, they will spend some time, they will go away, maybe have lunch, have a break, and they'll come back again if they find things interesting. So it depends on us how interesting we make these sets of sessions. And so she diligently went about setting each session as if it was the only one. So you will see that each session is actually fairly complete in itself in what it's trying to address. The idea was that the situation around us is completely unusual. It is something that nobody has foreseen even 10 months ago. So since we are here, how do we address the current present? How do we look at the time that is coming in the immediate future? And how does the long-term impact of this remain on us? As also, how much of our culture, habits will take over and we will spring back in our behavior? right now of the COVID-19 pandemic on people, their behavior, our cultural behavior, our social etiquette, our businesses, our economy. We see economy and business taking three clear paths. And I'm now talking of the here and now. One, those which have got severely damaged by the situation created by the pandemic those which required large numbers of people to be fit movie theaters, sporting events, and the like. And then people are hesitant to sit together for an extended period of time, and certainly in a tube that is closed. So a train, a plane, uh, you know, buses, other modes of transport where you are locked in for a while with people that you're not familiar with in the common airspace. It is also interesting to note that there are businesses which have significantly benefited from the current situation. And these are businesses either to do with the healthcare and services or businesses to do with things like technology and communication or just delivering things to our homes and our offices. Because we are not able to do, go out, we still want to live our lives. So things are being delivered to us and all of these have become the new patriots the new warriors against this unseen enemy. Because at one point, we were fating doctors. We added the security forces to this. But if you think about it, each one of them is doing something which is unbelievable, going out. And in the early days, of course, it appeared everybody was putting themselves in harm's way and putting themselves at risk every day. As time has gone on, the realization that there is a risk but it's not an immediate risk to everybody, which is going to knock off the entire world's population, has now set in where people are attempting to adapt to this new situation. Technology, which was a wave coming at us over the last 10 years. Well, the last 30 years, we have seen it changing. The last 10 years, the acceleration took place significantly, has earned new dimensions. We now see ourselves as digitalizing activities which we had not earlier imagined. The financial system, the decision-making system of organizations and governments, even if you look at the most uh, conventional, traditional, and conservative firms, they're all talking about building a new business model. One, 
where technology is much deeply driven into their system. Another one issue is about efficiency and cost. Because of the beating that the economies have taken and their impact on individual firms, every firm is now looking inward at what is the core of their business and attempting to see, can I strengthen the core while shedding many other things which may or may not be necessary? So this behavior of ours on going out with hesitation, meeting people with even more hesitation, and certainly not being able to meet people physically, hug people, have a chat with a friend uh, sitting around a coffee or a drink over, over an evening, all of these are creating a new social behavior as well. I'm delighted that we have one of the preeminent thinkers in the world who thinks about where we are going and I know he calls himself a technology forecaster, but I've had some interaction with Paul earlier, and I know that he's got an amazing brain which seems to have stretched way beyond his head, and he's able to see things which many of us are not able to connect in terms of where the dots are and where we are going. So it would be an absolute delight to listen to people like Paul and Rajiv, who will guide this, this session. He's again an amazing tech expert. For us in India, he's a familiar face on TV, showing us why we should buy something or why we should not expect <laughs> something. So Rajiv, uh, thank you for making the time to, to, uh, to manage and moderate this session with Paul. Uh, each session, as you will see post this, is attempting to do a 360 degrees review when you collectively put them together. And by the way, it has been done carefully. While they may look random, but if you take a step back and look at the entire system, you will see how coordinated it is designed to be to create a real picture where we are, where we appear to be going, and where the real opportunities and the road bumps are going to be. I hope you will spend as much time as possible in these two days and see the tremendous effort that has been made by the IMA team and all those who worked with them and hopefully benefit from it. Thank you very much. So Rajiv, I think you're opening. Yes, I think uh, I think it's time for me. Yes, thank you so much, Mr. Munjal, Mr. Kirloskar, uh, Paul. Fantastic to have you here, Rekha. Thank you so much for the introduction and congratulations on what seems to be an incredible event that you've pulled off against all odds. To everybody that's joined in, thank you so much and welcome. Uh, we hope these this session and all the ones that follow right after are going to be things that help you to maybe rethink the whole thing. You know, there is a lot of doom and gloom around, uh, but it's not all bad uh, they say sometimes the greatest innovations come through a crisis uh, sometimes people say it's just us trying to figure out in the middle of a crisis but there is enough proof and history and paul will take us through maybe some of that in terms of the fact that there is enough proof that through within a crisis comes the greatest technology innovation especially and we take huge leaps forward at a time like this uh, Mr. Mujal said something very, very clear and correct, and that is that we've taken some fantastic moves forward in terms of technology. And they say that the last 10 years of technology and innovation actually dwarf anything that's happened since the dawn of mankind. And a lot of this has come through a time where there has been a crisis, where we've been forced to think out of the box. So I think I'm looking forward today to find out, uh, you know, there are lots and lots of thoughts as to what happens when we actually are in the middle of a crisis, like an unprecedented one like COVID-19. And Paul is, of course, absolutely and totally the best person to start and kick things off. I'm going to give you a short introduction, even though I think Paul needs no introduction. Paul is a Silicon Valley based forecaster, exploring long term technology trends and their impact in society. Now, something very fascinating that he says is that first we invent our technologies and then we turn around and use technology to reinvent ourselves as individuals, as communities and as entire societies. Uh, Paul has, of course, uh, uh, like any good forecaster should, he has two decades of experience uh, exploring the dynamics of large scale long term changes. He teaches forecasting at Stanford University and chairs the future studies and forecasting track at Singularity University. So, Paul, uh, 
we're really looking forward to doing this just to give a little bit of a, a kind of a content frame to how we're going to go about it. Paul will, of course, come up with his thoughts right now. I will then uh, have some questions for Paul, but I also invite all of you in the chat session part of it to post your questions. I'd love to be able to put questions from audience, from everybody that's tuned in. Uh, so put in your questions out there and I will intersperse my questions with questions from the audience and take this forward. So now the stage, the virtual stage is all yours, Paul. Great. Thanks, Rajiv. And what I want to do is I'll just quickly share my screen here. I have um, a, a short, very short PowerPoint um, that I can use to help set some context here. And let's see if all this cooperates. So, Rajiv, can you see that first slide? Yes, absolutely. Great. It's it's absolutely Good. fine. OK, thank you. So uh, what I want to do is fly low and fast over some context that will frame our conversation for the next 45 minutes. Um, I call this chasing fire for a reason you'll see in a couple of minutes. But let me open with the notion that we live in an age defined by exponentials that that is the challenge of management today, is riding the waves of exponentials. And the problem with this is so far, we have focused on the positive exponentials, the one that we all know so well, uh, the exponential uh, growth of, of, of chip production that was first articulated by Gordon Moore. And there are lots of other positive exponentials. What we tend to overlook is at the same time, there are exponential challenges uh, like pandemics. And uh, as I'll come back to in a few minutes, this looks like a wave. Um, thinking about the pandemic as a wave, I think is not the most useful way to think about it. Think about it as a forest fire. Again, I'll come back to that. But it's not just the challenge of pandemics, there's the challenge of climate change. This is a chart of the Keeling curve after Charles Keeling, who started the project at the Scripps Institute in 1958. And this is carbon dioxide partial pressures. And if you look at this slide 10,000 years ago on the right, and you are here today, uh, or excuse me, you're the right, all the way on the right, it's clear this is not a sustainable curve. And other exponentials like, like population growth and the like. This is a moment of time when we are locked in a race between exponentials, between exponential opportunities and exponential challenges. And we have to find a way to use our exponential opportunities in the form of innovation to meet our exponential challenges. So how do you manage amidst this forest of exponentials? Uh, some quick thoughts. The first one is, first of all, absolutely be sure you're asking the right question. You know, we've all thought about the, the question of what's the effect of automation on jobs, and this has been even more scrambled in the next six months. The first question we started to ask, uh, actually, a long time ago was, are robots stealing our jobs? Which was an interesting question, but it, it wasn't quite right. Uh, actually, the robots really don't want our jobs, and it's not a question of substituting robots for human labor in a simple way. A slightly better way to frame the question is, what is the future of work? How does this exponential landscape of automation and robots and information technology and changing management styles change the shape of the future of work? That's a perfectly fine question. And I think it's a good tactical question at an organizational level. But if you're thinking about an entire nation, you're thinking about an entire society, or more specifically, if you're thinking about the entire global civilization, the right question, the question that really matters is, how can we create a moral economy in the digital age? It was a concept popularized by E.P. Thompson in the early part of the last century. Um, and um, and it, it's, it's a question very, very relevant today. This is meant to be flying low and fast, so I'm just issue spotty and I'm not going to go into the details. And let me push on to the central question. How do you fight an exponential? The pandemic is not a wave. It's a fire. 
it's a wildland fire, not unlike the fires that are burning here across California or in Australia and, and, and elsewhere. And ask any wildland firefighter and they'll say, catch it early um, because fires are an exponential phenomenon. And if you wait, it's not gonna be twice as big, it's gonna be 10 times as big. You catch it early, starve it of fuel, limit the growth phase, catch the slops and spots and stop the momentum. Sounds like a great plan, just means we need a better fire department, uh, not just in fighting fires, but we need exponential fire departments. So let me give you a, a, a case study of how tricky this can be. Back in 2016, there was a fire here in the hills behind Silicon Valley. And uh, that's a picture of the fire. And we have this picture because a UPS driver just happened to be driving on the road above it. And he literally caught a picture of the fire within minutes of when it started. And he put it up on on, on Facebook live stream and he called our emergency response, what we call 911, the fire trucks were rolling out of their fire stations within minutes of when this fire started. Oh, and by the way, that little, little white dot, that's a Cal Fire firefighting helicopter that just happened to be cruising past on its way back to its base. So the fire department knew about this fire within minutes. And even though it was a hot day in September, uh, just like it is today, they, of course, got right on top of the fire. The fire trucks raced out. They got there and they put out the fire before sunset on September 26th. Well, except they didn't. It turns out the fire that started on September 26th was not put out until October 8th. It took 15 days, hundreds of fire personnel, you can see the statistics here, burned nearly 5,000 acres. But like, so the question is, what happened? Well, it turns out fire is an exponential phenomena. Fire is like any other exponential challenge. Fire trucks accelerate arithmetically. So even as those fire trucks were getting out on the freeway and racing faster and faster to this fire, they weren't even like the Red Queen in Alice in Wonderland. As you recall, the Red Queen had to run faster and faster in order to stay in one place. In this case, the fire trucks, even as they were accelerating, were falling farther and farther behind the fire. And with all the hundreds of personnel and all the resources in Silicon Valley, it still took 15 days to put the fire out. So getting there early really matters and doing all those other things really matter too. But sometimes, in an age of exponential challenges, identifying the right question early is not enough. Getting to the fire early is not enough. Sometimes the only option is this, to fight fire with that fire. We backfire on our fires in California. This is fighting exponentials with exponentials, that we use the positive exponentials to meet our exponential challenges and make sure that in this age defined by exponentials, that at the end of the day, the positive exponentials win out over the negative exponentials. And Rajiv, I will stop there and we can go to a conversation and I'm dying to see the questions that we get in. Yes, uh, questions from the audience already starting to get in. But, uh, you know, Paul, uh, you left us at a, a fascinating space with that presentation saying fight fire with fire, right? So can we start from there looking at our current situation? How do we fight fire with fire in our current situation that we all, like I said, are in the middle of doom and gloom, whether it's for business or as a per in individual or otherwise? Uh, what are we looking at right now? Um, is there something going on? What are you referring to? I'm just <laughs> the pandemic. <laughs> yes. Yes. No. Um, well, I, the, the, and I've been involved. Uh, you know, I should say we should keep in mind that this pandemic is uh, next, possibly with the exception of the great earthquake that will eventually hit San Francisco. This pandemic has to be the most predicted event in my career as a forecaster. I have worked on more pandemic forecasts over the last couple of decades than I'd care to, uh, uh, care to talk about. The surprise was how a local pandemic 
turned into a global pandemic. And, and, and I will be blunt, that was the failure of several world leaders, um, one in China and one in the United States, who frustrated the attempts to control this. This should have been a little brush fire. And it turned into a big wildland fire because early steps uh, were, were taken in the wrong way. Um, I think at this point, what it is, is you we basically have to throw the kitchen sink at this thing, that there is not a single uh, silver bullet that's gonna solve it, that we've got to continue with wearing face masks, doing all the common sense things to minimize spread. And, um, and then of course, hope that vaccines show up. But as you and I were talking privately off stage earlier, I completely agree with you. The, the vaccine isn't going to instantly solve things, that it's the combination of therapeutics and everything else. So basically what we all have to do is so throw the kitchen sink at it. And above all, it's a management issue. All the tools we had, all the tools we needed to stop this pandemic existed years ago. And what failed here was a failure of, of management by the people responsible for controlling it. Okay. So, uh, Paul, of course, uh, once again, off, uh, you know, privately when we were talking, uh, you would mentioned to me before that when you'd heard for the first time about a pandemic or at least a virus in China, uh, secretly, because you didn't know at that time that it was going to spread like this, secretly you were a little happy about it. Uh, can you tell us the reason why? Oh, gosh. Uh, yes. Okay. I'm so busted. Um, you know, it's it's one of the artifacts of being a forecaster is the weirder things get than more normal it feels for me. Um, and by coincidence, so my class at the start of winter quarter, which started in January, was on uh, long range foresight. It's titled Foresight for Innovators. And as a part of that class, I always even though these are engineering students, I have to remind them of their exponential math. And of course, a virus is, is biologic process, perfect example. I'm just a forecaster. I'm not a virologist. I have no expertise in this stuff. But as a forecaster, I make sure I hang around with people who know what's going on. And a friend turned me on to what was going on in China in mid-December. And I, uh, I, I'll I, confess, I, I, had no, I, I had no idea that it was gonna be as bad as it was. But it was wonderful because I thought this is a present tense in the news case study for my students. And so on January 10th, when class started, I said, we're going to do a forecast of this. And uh, the rest of, as they say, is history. So I was not taking delight in the pandemic. I was just a <laughs> professor who was trying to plan his classes. OK, yeah, that, interesting. So. Uh, you know, Paul, uh, I started off by saying something and we continuously hear about this all the time that from within crisis comes some of the greatest innovations. And then I kind of also spoke about it a little reflectively saying that is that usually true or do we say that to ourselves because we're in the middle of a crisis and therefore start to make ourselves feel better by saying that, you know, there is a silver lining from within this dark cloud and we come out on the other side, there will be a lot of innovation. We'll make huge strides sure. forward. Is it really true? Is that what will come out of even this pandemic that there will be a huge amount of technological and other innovations and when we come out on the other side, we'll actually be better off than we ever were before. Do you truly forecast that as something that will happen this time? Well, I, I agree with your observation that innovation comes out of creative turbulence when fields bump against other fields and emergencies. So you know, this particular one, as I think about the premise of your question, that this is a, a wonderful opportunity for technology innovation. It reminds me of the immortal words of John Jacob Astor, who while sitting in the bar of the SS Titanic was heard to remark, I know I asked for ice, but this is ridiculous. So, um, <laughs> but without a doubt, I mean, I, take a case of video conferencing. Uh, so I've been in this business for a couple of decades. You might say I'm a futurist with a past. And way back in the early 1990s, I was doing study after study on the business benefits of video conferencing and trying to persuade the CEOs of Fortune 50 companies that they needed to adopt it. I even wrote a paper uh, for Bell Labs titled Believable Broadband for Business. Well, all it took was 20 years and a pandemic 
to make us understand. And you could take video conferencing as a case in point that what we're now seeing is video conferencing has always been focused on simulating face-to-face -face meetings. And now what we're seeing is we're through that in the last six months. Now everybody's saying, how can we change this as a medium and make it truly unique? One area to watch, by the way, uh, is that this is going to give a big boost to is um, uh, virtual shared virtual realities and um, 3D head-mounted displays. That that I my guess is maybe maybe take a little longer than five years, but uh, in a very short period of time, the next time. Um, uh, we have a meeting like this. Ima is hosting it. Everybody will wearing, be wearing goggles. Okay. All right. So, uh, you know, those would be some technologies. Uh, you're completely right about one thing that uh, people that have never, ever, ever even thought of getting onto a video conference call today are absolute experts. There are people who can teach me things. I'm sure they can teach you things about a video conference call. People who had never done a video conference call before the pandemic actually broke out. So, yes, it has been a huge move forward. But how will the COVID influence technology development and application? I, are there bigger things to look forward to, especially uh, the, the audience that we're addressing right now, uh, management students and others, uh, business, industries, large industries, small uh, businesses that are run by three or four people? What are the things that will be the single greatest teachings that will come out of this? And what do we look forward to? How will things dramatically change? What will be those that will remain permanent and what will be those that we took to in the middle of this pandemic and we'll abandon after it's over? Well, that could be a very long conversation. Um, <laughs> let me continue uh, as an example, take video conferencing and remote work as okay. an example of how to frame it. You know, a balloon once expanded never returns to its original shape. We are not about to go entirely virtual. This is not about substituting physical offices for pure virtual meetings. But what we have now done irreversibly is something more subtle, but much more profound. And that is that the physical workplace, that physical workplace that we augmented a little bit with telephone and computers is now very much become a work space that fully integrates cyberspace into physical space. And so as managers, and executives at companies, we all need to think about how does that change the way we manage for competitive advantage? How do we become more efficient? It's not like, okay, we're done with the office, we'll go fully remote. There are companies who will do that. There are companies that have already done. There will be some companies who say, we're sorry, everybody needs to be here physically. But the majority of companies are gonna be dealing with this very complex cocktail of saying who needs to be face to face, who needs to be remote. And so, you know, it's easy to jump onto the really dramatic stuff like, yeah, we're gonna get, you know, flying, flying cars and all that stuff, but ignore the flashy stuff. It's the subtle stuff that's really gonna take management finesse to make the most of. And that seemingly very simple task of how do you combine in-person and remote becomes really complex really fast. Okay. So do you believe some of the big changes, like a, a lot of prediction that is coming in now is that uh, suddenly, especially commercial and office space is something that people will have to relook because people have suddenly realized that uh, they can actually work from home. They're very, very efficient when they work from home. Uh, work hasn't really suffered. Do you believe in the future, uh, the number of office and real estate space that is required will also go through a dramatic change because that's one of the big predictions that keeps coming out uh, from within this, that one of our greatest learning is going to be that you do not need to have 7,000 people come to work every day from nine to five and sit in one particular enclosed space to actually be an efficient organization or enterprise. Right. Well, what I would do is all those all the predictions that people are making about this, that from a management perspective, treat them as indicators and treat them as indicators of the conversation that will change the work landscape. Innovation is a conversation. Innovators propose and consumers and businesses dispose. 
And the interviewer says, hey, what do you think of this idea? And the business goes, actually, no, that's not a great idea. And you know, most, most innovations fail, most technologies fail. So what you're seeing, when you see those conversations, don't worry about guessing who's right. Just say, I wanna find the ones that frame the conversation most richly so I can be an innovator early on in how to use it effectively. Office real estate is not gonna disappear. Uh, there are, of course, going to be changes in offices. Uh, if I was in the HVAC business uh, and, and they're already doing this thing, we better change the HVAC systems and find ways to innovate. And, and the retrofit business is actually more important than the new build business. But no, we're not going to all move to electronic cottages. And, and if anybody you think, you know, it's pretty nice if you're in your 50s and you have a really nice mansion and you're well to do, um, it's rather a different story if you were, you know, invite everybody on this call to imagine back, they're now 22 years old, they're just out of university, they're starting their first job, they probably have an absolutely tiny little apartment and, um, and not even a balcony. Imagine how much fun it is for all those 20 somethings right now who've been locked down in apartments like that. They are desperate to go to offices. Okay. So uh, Paul, we're getting lots and lots of questions uh, on from the audience right now, but I'm just going to kind of park that to one side because I have one or two more of my own. And then I'm going to take some questions from the audience. Just for everybody who's sending the questions, do keep sending them in. I'll try and take all of them as quickly as possible. So Paul, I want to go back to something that I found fascinating in that small presentation that you made that uh, ever since, and you know, I think you showed us a cover of uh, a magazine that was from the 1930s or something like that, where uh, the robot was saying that, look, I don't really want your job. You've been telling us that we've been asking the wrong question and we've been asking the wrong question every single time. But yet, even now in everybody's mind, uh, the robots have now transformed themselves and are the imagery of what we think of what will take over our jobs is a combination of things. It could be robotic skills. It could actually be AI algorithms, a lot of things, software, codes, apps, lots and lots of things that are coming in that are taking away jobs. What's the right question to ask right now? about the future of workers and jobs? Well, it goes back to that notion of E.P. Thompson and creating a moral economy. To, to put a very sharp point on it, this is the modern challenge. All of our positive exponentials have delivered us to an, an age of abundance, that you know things that were scarce and expensive are now commonplace and cheap. Everybody on this call can think of their own examples. But the problem is that we've come into this age of abundance trapped in scarcity thinking. We're all alive today. Each one of us individually is alive today because we have an unbroken line of ancestors who were so good at overcoming scarcity that they lived long enough to reproduce. And if just one of our ancestors had made a mistake, one of us would not be here. The problem is that when you take scarcity thinking and you put it into an age of abundance, uh, you get trouble. You, well, a good case in point, sugar, sweet stuff was very, very scarce once upon a time. And our distant ancestors would think nothing of raiding a beehive and grabbing the honey and getting stung because they wanted that high energy source of calories. These days, sugar is ubiquitous and expensive and the result is type two diabetes. So, our search for scare, our, our obsession with scarcity in an age of abundance literally can kill us. And what we need to do is recognize in this age of abundance, we need to lighten up on our desire to own everything and control everything and figure out how that as a business model, not as an idealistic political idea, but as a business model, we can be successful by learning how to spread the abundance around. Okay, that's very interesting. So um, lots to talk to you about that also. I'm going to take a few questions because the number of questions are quite a few. I'm going to ask for quick answers from you. Yes, uh, question from uh, Professor uh, Bala Subramaniam. What is the impact of virtual classes on the entire teaching learning process? And, and I think he all really wants to know in the long term. Yeah, hey, give me a call. I'd love to talk to you. Uh, 
<laughs> this is changing in real time. Just for us, I'm sure it's the same at your university that I'm on a faculty call twice a week where we're all trading tips and tricks and and the like. Um, I think it's too soon to tell. Um, and I'm, in this case, way too close to the nuts and bolts to come up with a short, intelligent answer. But I would say the theme very much is share ideas like crazy. Just yesterday, I was on a faculty call. I heard about two new, really interesting apps that I'd never heard of before. I've got like 30 or 40 apps I've heard about in the last two months. So it's it's moving fast and the message is stay on the edge and keep looking for the new stuff. But is this actually uh, okay in terms of the student that's learning and the teacher that's trying to teach? Is this okay, what we're doing right now? Is this something that you think is short term or do we believe that it will actually have a very, very long term side effects on the people that are being taught and the ones that are trying to teach with a medium that many teachers have never touched before? In India, especially, we have students who actually don't own anything more than maybe a small little phone, and they prop that up, and they're trying to yeah. learn from well, that. Rem remember that part where things. I said, we got to learn how to use abundance thinking? There is no right. rational reason why every, I mean, the cost of computers is so low, there's no rational reason why every student shouldn't be able to have a computer. Um, and in terms of the innovation, that it's going to, take a while here. I'm, I'm worried about us losing a generation of students while we figure this out. But without a doubt, we're going to end up with a much richer education landscape. And the classic model of building a university, you know, even, even in India, where you've done a marvelous job of building new universities, it's not enough to keep up with the demand for students. It's not enough to keep up with uh, distance learning and lifelong learning and the like. So uh, it, we're in for a turbulent couple of years, but we're going to come out the other side with some far more capable systems. But you did say something uh, that uh, also resonates with me that a whole generation of students may just become uh, a bit of a case study for everything else that comes out on the other side. That I think is very, very true. And every uh, single one of us has a responsibility to make sure that we help them along because it's our fault. Right. Okay, so a question from Varun Surya. What other services or activities do you forecast to be streamable in the future? Because we've learned that we can literally, I mean, video conferencing became uh, uh, one of our greatest innovations untouched before and suddenly the big savior. Are there other things uh, that, they, that you believe will be uh, streaming in the future that we haven't thought of right now? Well, I think the biggest change is we're going to, instead of looking at each other through these magical portholes of computer screens, which is pretty darn old fashioned, uh, that we will have immersive environments, wearable headsets, where we literally have the space all the way around us. We've been working on this stuff for decades and decades and decades. And uh, this is, and we're so close to having the right hardware. This circumstance that we're in is just causing tons of money and attention to go in taking that stuff to the last mile. My advice, if you want to look at where the innovation in remote face-to-face -face communication is, it's video games. That everybody, everybody who considers themselves a manager or a senior executive, if you aren't paying close attention to the bleeding edge of video games, you're missing out on some of the most important management indicators out there. All right. So so you're talking about both the gamification part of it as well as all the technologies that surround games, which is the virtual part. Well, I'm, I'm not talking the, about gamification. I'm talking about real honest God games. Um, all right. You know, uh, shoot 'em ups and stuff. There are other, comp uh, other examples. We had social virtual realities like Second Life, uh, mm -hmm. you know, 12, 15 years ago, and all those variations. Um, there's uh, the founder of Second Life's got a, a new uh, project called HiFi that's quite extraordinary. So you're going to see all sorts of new kinds of social virtual realities. They're already coming out in prototype 
and uh, we're going to look back and laugh that once upon a time we were staring at each other through computer screens. By the way, the one other thing, anybody who's using a virtual screen, um, that was kind of funny for the six, first six months. These days, if you use a virtual screen, you're in danger of looking like a dork. That, you know, it's a little bit, remember custom ringtones? And that was a big, mm -hmm. exciting business and everybody had them for a while. And then we realized they were kind of dopey and we just went back to standard ringtones. The thing that matters is have an honest to God background. Don't use virtual backgrounds. You'll, your grandchildren will make fun of you when they see the video. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Some good advice out there for everybody that's been doing that in their Zoom calls and their other calls is not to have that space background behind you, right? So that's important. Okay. Uh, someone, Shubham Kumar uh, is asking you to take your uh, futurist hat off and uh, uh, put on the uh, psychology hat. How can we motivate ourselves in this pandemic? Hmm. Uh, uh, well, I mean, I think the answer is different for different people. Um, to me, the way I, I stay motivated in all of this is, uh, first of all, as a forecaster, I was only half kidding. The weirder things are, the more comfortable I am. Uh, a lot of foresight. So when I think about foresight and being a futurist, I'm not predicting things. I'm thinking about mapping a cone of uncertainty that extends out in the future. So when I said to my students on January 10th, we're going to follow this pandemic. And a week later, I said to them, do you think we'll get to the end of the quarter before the campus was shut down? They looked at me like I was a crazy person. I said, I'm not predicting it. What I'm saying is, think about that cone of uncertainty that extends out into the present, out in the future. Map that cone. We all know the way you deal with crazy things is you simulate them first. Fighter pilots go in flight simulators. Uh, firefighters learn how to do their job over and over and over. It becomes second nature. Managers, their way to simulate and the way to cope is to think about all the possibilities and how you would respond. Uh, though I have to admit, Hunter S. Thompson, that famous gonzo journalist of many years ago, in one of his books wrote, he said, when the going turns weird, the weird turn pro. And at moments, I think that may be the best advice is the weird turn pro. Okay. Okay. Uh we have, I've been told that we have a little bit of time that uh, I think about five minutes or more left. So I'm going to actually, I'll try and see if I can fit in some more questions. So keep those coming. But um, Paul, there's never a good uh, conversation between two people uh, like the kind that we're having without a quick fire round between me and you, right? So let's see if we can do that. Uh, a very, uh, and this is a quick fire round. So everything should be about a sentence or so in terms of an answer. Okay, the first one. A very obvious current trend that we all seem to be missing out on. Oh, thanks. Oh, well, that's a question to me. Um, uh, technology is the solvent leaching the glue out of our institutions. That the, the uncertain nature of nation states, the rise of city states, think about the impact of technology at a global policy level. And the central challenge for us is how do we create a global civilization? Okay. Uh, what do you personally, and this is absolutely you personally, not the larger picture, what do you look forward to personally to happen in the next five years that will happen for sure and you can't wait for it to happen? Uh, I can't wait for those wearable headsets. I want a headset good enough to wear that isn't going to make me nauseous because of screen lag. Right. Okay. So, 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 so that, that, that's pretty much around the corner. We're starting to see a lot of those uh, in prototype and otherwise. So the concept one should become reality because it, it's got a great boost right now. Okay. Next one. What's the one thing that you're pretty sure will happen in the next five years, but you're not looking forward to it at all? Uh, the next pandemic. <laughs> You're pretty sure that that is going to happen within the next five years itself? It's like wildland fires. We've had <laughs> our, our worst fires of the last 50 years have been in the last two years. Okay. 
So, so Mr. Munjal, Mr. Kirloskar, Rekha, the off-camera conversation we were having wasn't only about solving this one. I think you have to also start looking at the next one, which is coming in the next five years. Okay, Paul, the biggest problem with how we think about and use technology today. We tend to use new technologies to pave the cow paths. To do an, the, initially, we take a new technology and we use it to make some old activity marginally more efficient, like we're doing with this video stuff. You have to say paving the cow paths is, is the wrong way to go. We need to use the new technology to come up with entirely new things. Plastic, when it was first invented by William Bakelin, Bakelite, everybody tried to make it look like wood and tortoiseshell. It took them about 15 years before they realized it made really lousy wooden tortoiseshell. They said, let plastic be plastic. Then things got interesting. So think about that analogy. Use technology for deep innovation. Don't just do marginal efficiencies on old things. Okay, interesting. Okay, Paul, you've been in the business. You've been doing this for a while, decades now as a forecaster. Aren't we done the yet? Big uh, I, I, <laughs> I think almost. Uh, okay, I'll get I'm a, waiting for the question. As a forecaster, so like I said, you've been doing it for a while. As a forecaster, the biggest thing that you've got wrong till now. Oh, God, if I'm not wrong at least three times before breakfast, I'm not doing my job. <laughs> um, the, if, if you want to say what's the most painful thing, okay. it's not being wrong. It's uh, making the forecast is only half the job. It's making convincing people to act. And the most painful thing for me has been when I have been right and ignored. And the fault was mine because I didn't communicate it clearly. So my advice to everyone is look out into the future, think about a cone of uncertainty, not point predictions, and then think very hard about how you're gonna make that vision real to other people. Because if you can't, it will go nowhere. And that's the essence of innovation is how do you take that unique vision you have and make it real and convincing in a way that the rest of the world follows you? Okay. Okay, Paul. And my last and final question, and this is where you have to use all that incredible forecasting abilities that you've accumulated over the years. You've come to India. What can you forecast about the next time that you come to India? What are you really looking forward to doing first in here, in India? What have you missed most about us? Oh, gosh, that is, you are torturing me, sir. Uh, <laughs> I have loved, uh, I, I've been to India several times. I've always loved it. And my great regret was that I was always so busy with going to business meetings that I barely scratched the surface of Indian culture. I never got up to the hill country. I have a special interest in the history of the Indian pundits, the surveyors, and that I am absolutely bound and determined the next time I go to India, I'm going to have a chance to sink into some of the vast history that I've been so interested in. Okay. So I look forward to, are you doing that, doing that too? I know we've completely run out of time, but I have a lot of questions from people and the overall premise of what they're saying really is, Paul, anything in the last parts of this conversation between you and I, where you can leave your final words with people for them to feel a little bit better about what they're going through right now and what the future looks like for them, anything that would sure. make them feel better. We're in a time of vast uncertainty. But that's good news. Uncertainty is possibility. Uncertainty is opportunity. Our collective actions in the present shape the future. We are not bystanders. This is a moment of enormous, enormous opportunity. Think about management structures, governmental structures. This has knocked all of the, all the folks who are against change off balance. If you wanna effect a change, do it in the middle of a crisis when all of the antibodies who are against change aren't noticing. So this really is a huge opportunity to implement change. And you know the old story, the old line, pessimists are often right, but it's only optimists who get things done. Be an optimist. <laughs>
All right. Thank you so much, Paul. That was absolutely wonderful. I think Mr. Munjal said it right that uh, just having a conversation with you for just 45 minutes uh, truly and absolutely delivers the future to us. And those last words from you were very, very interesting for us to actually look forward to the future. And nothing is more interesting than looking forward to the future. With that, thank you, everybody who joined in. I'm sorry the number of questions that have poured in now have been a complete and absolute deluge, but I unfortunately don't have the time to put it on. I'm sure at some point in life, Paul will be available for a private chat or maybe he'll be available out here. Do uh, uh, have a conversation with him. Thank you, everyone. And back to uh, Rekha and everybody back at IMA. Thank you, Rajiv. Thank you, Paul. Thank you so much. Thank you.